Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Digital Pound Foundation and Crypto UK joint webinar talking about navigating the future of the stablecoin market, which is, I think, a huge topic. And I hope we're going to do it justice in the hour that we have. We've got a wonderful lineup of speakers here, including a keynote from Danelle Dixon, CEO and Executive Director of the Stella Foundation, uh, as well as a great panel. Um, what I'm going to do now is just um, give everyone a few minutes to join. Um, and while people are joining in, ask uh, Tina Baker-Taylor, who's a non-executive director at Crypto UK, to kindly give us a little bit of an introduction to the topic before we hand over to Jana Pache from the Digital Pound Foundation, who's going to be moderating. So I'm just going to uh, stop sharing this slide and I'll allow everyone to take it forward from here. So over to you, Tina. Thanks, Helen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today and for Crypto UK to share this opportunity with the Digital Pound Foundation. Um, I'm Tina Baker-Taylor and I'm on the board of Crypto UK and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, so society and everyday life has been exponentially changed since the internet enabled us to transfer and receive data around the world securely, instantly, and for free. And over the past decade, blockchain technology has opened up the possibilities of integrating the speed, reach, and always-on information platform of the internet with finance, enabling an ability to upgrade and transform our financial system. The evolution of blockchain and tokenization specifically now allows for money and value to be shared in the same open, transparent, and real-time capability of the internet. The very first stable coins emerged in 2014 and were initially collateralized by other crypto tokens. And in 2015, we really saw the rise of the first fiat backed stable coins and they were made available to the market. And these assets were originally designed to allow traders to move value across borders and across trading venues with reduced price volatility during that time and without the friction of having to cash out and in at multiple trading venues. However, stablecoins quickly evolved uh, to be considered as a convenient payment mechanism, giving their uh, ability to remit money worldwide seamlessly 24-7. Use cases for stablecoins continue to rapidly evolve given their digitally native attributes and open source design, which allows them to be seamlessly integrated into digital applications that are cross-compatible with other systems and that settle transactions nearly instantly. These features are in sharp contrast with the off-chain closed system operations of traditional banks and payment services, which can still require days to settle. Today, stablecoins are opening up access to more effective cross-border payments, more transparent and effective humanitarian and disaster relief, and providing meaningful financial services to underbanked individuals and businesses who have been historically woefully underserved. Stablecoins, in essence, provide true real-time money at the speed and transparency of the internet, not just simply sitting on top of the internet like some fintech solutions introduced over the last decade have uh, evolved, but integrated within the very fabric of the internet itself. And that open source capability of blockchain technology and digital uh, currency tokens that sit within them enable transparency, speed, and significantly reduce costs. Um, than the financial system has been able to provide to date. So why is this important? You may be thinking that our payment systems work just fine today, and in many countries they do. Real-time payments offer speed and FinTech solutions exist that reduce costs for services like wire payments. However, these all exist within closed loop systems that are exclusive and proprietary and they require accounts and services like Venmo are domestic in their nature. Stable coins backed by real world assets like fiat reduce user friction, transaction time, and cost. In addition to offering slippage and liquidity production for traders and investors during volatile periods within crypto capital markets, they can be sent and received by literally anyone, anywhere, anytime. And this becomes really significant when we consider how we live and work are rapidly changing. Gig workers and content creators around the world can now receive payments for their services in real time. Smaller value, large volume, mass payouts for services like app developers, royalties for musicians, and humanitarian aid can now be sent for fractions of their historical cost. 
uh, with the added benefit of on-chain transparency that the blockchain uh, enables. It allows both the sender and the recipient to view those transactions immediately. So today we're going to hear from some of the leading innovators using stablecoins to transform how many is set and received. We'll explore the evolving practical use cases for stablecoins, the commercial incentives and drivers for those use cases, and how they're helping people and businesses today. And our expert panel will examine the operating models for stablecoins and how the market structures underpinning these use cases and applications might evolve given the regulatory changes on the horizon and the growing convergence between the traditional and digitally native financial ecosystems. So our first speaker, in my opinion, is a true pioneer in the stablecoin payments ecosystem. I definitely don't want to steal her thunder, but in my opinion, she has been trailblazing a path to increase access and prosperity around the world, like few um, uh, around the world that few others um, have been able to do, and has created partnership opportunities with world-leading organizations and traditional financial partners um, that really demonstrate the possibilities for stablecoin in an undeniable way. But I will let her tell you more about this. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Danelle Dixon, the CEO of the Stellar Development Foundation. Danelle, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Tina. That was an awesome introduction and a great way to get into the discussion around stablecoins. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be with all of you here today to talk about the impact of one of my truly most important topics that I try to bring to light all the time, which is stablecoins and their role in making our financial system more accessible. I've been in blockchain for about five years now, and I've seen a lot of industry transformation in that time. And in many ways, it echoes parts of my earlier career in Web2, where I worked on some of the web's most challenging content problems, like net neutrality and privacy. The web took time to mature, and it took time for us to get people comfortable with purchasing things online, inputting your credit card information, your banking online. But here we are today with excellent UX design and privacy controls, and we all made that leap. So it was through my Web2 work that I learned a lot about what it takes to get people on board for technological change and to get people comfortable with innovation generally. And that's where we are with blockchain and digital assets right now. We're demonstrating why this is an important transformation for the global financial system. We're explaining why stable coins and tokenization of real world assets are an essential part of that. And in my time with you today, I'd like to talk about the transformation journey, sharing the transformations that have already happened today, the real impact that stable coins and digital assets are making in the world right now, and also exploring where innovation goes next. There is a lot of work yet to be done to realize the impact for future transformation. To start with this transformation and impact we've seen so far, I'm best suited to tell this story through the lens of what we're working on at the Stellar Development Foundation. Sometimes I'm going to call it SDF for short. Um, and what's happening on the Stellar Network. For those who aren't familiar, Stellar is a public blockchain that is decentralized. It's, it's fast. It's scalable. It's sustainable. It was really, really built for payments and asset issuance. And it's built for financial products and services. It offers builders smart contract functionality and a protocol optimized for payments with a design that's intended to keep fees low and to provide transaction speeds that can scale with increased adoption. It was designed for fiat backed assets like stable coins and it was something that we were doing way back in 2014 before that was even a word that existed. Because the network was built with the idea in mind to make money move like email and tokenization of secure, stable assets have always been at the center of that design. And our role at the SDF, it, it, we're a nonprofit organization, is to support the development and growth of the Stellar Network and that ecosystem that's built around it. We serve the ecosystem of NGOs, enterprises, small businesses, governments, and solo developers and entrepreneurs that are building on the Stellar Network. We do that by offering tooling, funding, and through strategic collaborations, all in an effort to drive toward our mission of creating equitable access to the global financial system through using blockchain technology. We like to say Stellar is where blockchain, blockchain meets the real world because we, we believe achieving our mission requires a focus on utility and a focus on improving daily life. 
Stellar's design and optimizations are focused on what drives that kind of utility. Low fees, fees are a fraction of a cent per transaction for developers, fast transaction time, ledger close in five seconds, sustainable, the consensus mechanism is low energy, requiring annually the same amount of energy as a few dozen homes in the United States. And importantly for this conversation, asset issuance. Every type of asset from fiat currencies, securities, CBDCs, and more can be digitally represented on Stellar in just four simple steps. With Stellar's built-in compliance features, asset issuers can easily tokenize assets with adaptable functions designed for any organization's specific needs and standards. Assets tokenized on Stellar benefit from real-time payments, nearly instant transaction confirmations, settlements with finality, and globally accessible uh, on and off ramps and wallet partners. This is what has allowed the Stellar ecosystem to deliver some incredible products that are in market today using stablecoins. Stablecoins on Stellar are used to power impactful use cases like delivering cash assistance. There are about 300 million people globally in need of humanitarian, humanitarian assistance requiring almost $50 billion in funding annually to meet the need. In 2022, shortly after the war in Ukraine broke out, we realized that Stellar had both the tech and ecosystem of products and services to help make a positive difference on how that cash assistance gets delivered. It was a matter of bringing those component pieces together to create Stellar Aid Assist, a disbursement system that allows aid organizations to deliver cash assistance to vulnerable populations almost instantly. The UNHCR, the UN's refugee agency, has been using it since the end of 2022 to deliver aid into Ukraine. To date, it has, has distributed over $2.2 million worth of aid to more than 2,000 individuals, and it's, it's expanding it to other geographies. How it works. It leverages a USD stablecoin, USDC, issued by Circle, and a digital wallet called Vibrant, and the Stellar Disbursement Platform, a solution that lets you send bulk payments so that money can be sent anywhere almost instantly. And once that money is delivered, it can be cashed out into local currency thanks to MoneyGram. MoneyGram integrated on Stellar back in 2021, making Stellar the leading crypto to cash off-ramp in the world. These on and off ramps are so important to solving that last mile because all of this great stuff doesn't really matter if people can't get on or off the blockchain. So integrated wallets like those used in Stellar Aid Assist are able to cash out into local currency. So Stellar Aid Assist brings some important benefits to organizations and recipients. It brings traceability. So it allows end-to-end -end tracking of funds, which is really important on both sides of the equation. Portability. Recipients are able to safely transport and access funds when they need them, whether they are moving across borders or forced to flee. And thanks to USDC, the use of global reserve currency to protect against potential inflation and local currency devaluation. It's a really impactful innovation and it's being recognized as such. It just won multiple awards, most notably this year, Stellar Aid Assist just won the Webby Award for best use of Web3 technology. It's garnered this kind of recognition because it is meeting people where they are and was designed for people who really aren't familiar with crypto. So let me take a minute to show you what it looks like for them. So recipients get a text message to download the wallet. Importantly, this is based on the UNHCR already submitting and creating the transactions with the wallet and with the name, with the uh, phone number of the recipient so they can send that text message. They register their wallet with their phone number. They verify their identity and eligibility to make sure the aid is going to the right place. And then with, within minutes, the funds are in their account. And then since the wallet is integrated with MoneyGram, which has hundreds of thousands of locations globally, recipients can go pick up the local cash, pick up cash at the local cash or transfer to their bank account. And importantly, they can pick it up in whatever currency exists in the region that they're in. So if they received it while they were in Ukraine, but then they moved across the border, they can pick it up in whichever jurisdiction they're in, in the local currency. The process to go from enrollment, so right after you receive that text message, to actually receiving aid takes on average two minutes and 30 seconds. 
The component part of Stellar Aid Assist are essential to making this kind of global money movement possible, whether for cash assistance or for other kinds of disbursements like payroll. And it was because of the utility that the ecosystem was already building that we were able to bring Stellar Aid Assist to market in less than nine months. Stablecoins power so many other products on Stellar that are providing that real world utility that I've been talking about. For example, Decaf, it's a digital wallet that is globally available and also integrated with MoneyGram. It is helping people pay local employees in regions in Latin America, giving them payments in stablecoins as a hedge against inflation and keeping them safe from carrying that cash, which would put them at risk of theft. These uses wouldn't be possible without stablecoins. Stablecoins are a core component technology. And through these ecosystem companies that are using stablecoins, the Stellar Network is helping expand financial access and empowerment for some of the world's marginal, most marginalized communities. Since its inception, Stellar has been designed to complement traditional financial systems. And that's what these uses show. They show how blockchain can interact with what's already out there, traditional financial infrastructure, and to create real impact. But when we think about this technology and where it's going next and what transformations are still to come, I think that stablecoins are going to have some competition and not just from CBDCs. Last year, Franklin Templeton issued the first U.S. registered money market fund on Stellar that has driven cost efficiencies for them and, it, and now represents more than $360 million worth of real world assets on the network. I bring this up because I think that with more traditional financial institutions getting behind tokenization, it's a market that is expected to be about 12 trillion by 2030, that we could see some interesting future innovations on stable assets. And there is potential that certain TradFi players are gonna become competitors for today's leading stablecoin issuers, most notably in high income generating countries. These institutions are already getting regulatory approval for tokenized assets. For example, the New York DFS Greenlight, Greenlist now has more than a handful of approved assets. So they aren't shying away from the technology and they have the regulatory relationships. In markets with mature financial products and services, I think we could see a world where digital bank deposits start being tokenized and money market funds start being used as payments. But let me be clear. I think the existing stablecoin issuers have a leg up on many uses, especially in low and medium income countries. I just came back from West Africa and the demand for US backed stablecoins is enormous. I met with so many individuals and businesses that were innovating and solving these problems. And there is still a huge opportunity for solving B2B cross-border payments. I'll tell you why. On that trip, I met a young creator named Joy. Joy has an impressive portfolio, having worked with international companies on films and commercials. But every time Joy wants to export his talent and work globally, he runs into a flurry of payment challenges, despite being banked and very well connected. He has personal and bank accounts in the UK and Ghana, access to neobanks and payment apps, and a network he can leverage to make things happen in a pinch. But you name that payment hurdle and he's dealt with it. Absorbing, absorbing enormous fees to receive a wire transfer from hiring companies, slow send times, enlisting friends to help him engage local currency, exchange local currency to, to pay his local crew, getting questions from banks and payment platforms asking him why he keeps transferring his own money around, having bank accounts closed and his funds held for months, all the while losing money to fees himself at every step. And Joy is not alone. There are so many other individuals and businesses that do the same. I was simultaneously elated and frustrated while listening to Joy, elated because I saw the sheer number of Joy's challenges that could be solved by blockchain and stablecoins, and frustrated because it takes time to overcome the barriers, and I want it all to happen for Joy and others as soon as possible. So what are the barriers to adoption? What do we need to see to get the future state of innovation? I could say we need clear regulation. That's true in the United States, at least. The lack of regulatory clarity can certainly hamper or delay innovation, and that can help solve the challenges of today's financial system. But I think what we're all well aware of that particular barrier in certain regions. So instead, I'd like to focus on what I think we as an industry can do to advance innovation and adoption on our own. Doing the hard work and setting the example to build trust in this technology. 
I believe this comes through setting and, adoption and, and adopting shared standards. Standards are critical to interoperability, so all builders know the requirements for asset issuers, compliance standards for products, for example, token standards and issuer controls. And we need to be clear on stable coins, especially in the industry's marketing. Stable coins have to line up to their name. They have to be stable. Standards are paramount to building trust and helping us demonstrate that we're able to protect consumers not because regulation requires it to be so, but because the industry takes the initiative to show its maturity. When we live up to those standards, the foundations for common sense legislation and regulation on stable coins and digital assets will be obvious because we, the industry, have set the right tone. These standards also help us to live up to the ideal of global interoperability that blockchain enables. We can show that we're not just recreating walled gardens or a financially siloed system, that's how we show we're ready for mass adoption of stable coins and all that it enables. No long wait times or big fees from banks, global reach, near instant transaction times, and low cost fees. Blockchain and stable coins provide us incredible technology to transform today's fragmented financial system. But now it's up to all of us to use these innovations to show the world that they're delivering utility. We know that the foundation is there, the start of transformation. We've seen it with products like Stellarate Assist and the UNHCR, but we also know there's a lot more changed, changed ahead and many problems still to solve. If we take what we've transformed so far, listen to the unmet needs to figure out where transformation needs to go, take the initiative to demonstrate we're ready for the kind of mass adoption, then we can work together to transform everyday financial services in a real meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danelle, for that fantastic keynote, which I, I think, um, given some of the background to this webinar, um, sets exactly the right tone. So when we first started talking to our, uh, our partners at Crypto UK about having a joint event, we were really keen to do something very positive about the potential use and applications of stable coins, um, not just in the context that most people think of, but um, wider field as well. And I think um, Stellar and Danelle's example of the UNHCR use case for stable coins is a fantastic example of where something can be used to solve a problem that could not previously be solved through traditional payments me uh, mechanisms. So thank you very much for that. Um, just we'll be kicking off the panel in a minute. Um, I'm Jenna Pache. I'm an executive director and policy lead for the Digital Pound Foundation. For those of you who don't know, the Digital Pound Foundation is a trade association and think tank that advocates for the introduction of a well-designed digital pound in both publicly and privately issued forms in the UK. So we cover stable coins, tokenized deposits, tokenized e-money, all that stuff, as well as CBDC. Um, and we also um, advocate for a diverse, effective and competitive landscape and ecosystem for these new forms of digital money. Um, we will be taking Q&A throughout this session. Um, I will try and work in as much as we can into the webinar. If we can't answer your questions, I'm very sorry about that. If you can keep the questions on topic to this webinar, that would be really great as well. So, um, you know, we won't be able to take questions about individual companies or what they're doing or things like that, but we're very happy to talk about the stablecoin landscape and, you know, what participants see the emerging trends and, and barriers and things like that as. So I'm going to ask for a quick round of introductions from our, our panelists before we kick off. Um, Sean, would you like to go first? Thank you very much, Jenna. A fantastic presentation. My name is Sean Kiernan. I'm the founder and CEO of Greengage. We're a Web3 fintech delivering accounts in a crypto-friendly way, but we deliver them in fiat. We also source lending across traditional and digital providers. Our key clients are SMEs, family offices, and crypto companies. Thank you, Sean. Andy. Yeah, good afternoon, and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Andy Gallucci. I'm the Director of Regulatory Strategy at Circle, which is the largest regulated issuer of stable coins issuing uh, USDC, as well as our Euro uh, counterpart, EURC. Thank you, and Johnny. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Janet, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to come on your panel. Um, great keynote speech, and, and just a great summary of um, what's going on in the market. 
Um, I head up the digital asset strategy for ClearBank. ClearBank were the first bank in 250 years to be granted status as a clearing bank. So obviously the financial services sector is alive and kicking here in London, moving at some rapid pace. Um, we're very interested um, in the whole ecosystem of digital payments. Um, and obviously stable coins is very much part of that in terms of looking at different ways um, e e businesses are looking to use it in fintechs. We bank or provide payment services for around about 240 regulated companies here in the UK. So I have a, quite a good feeling for what people are looking at and what people, where, where they're looking to move their business. And we, we're looking to provide that infrastructure in various different payments. But, uh, but thanks again for having us today. Thanks, Johnny. Very. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Varun Paul. I'm a Senior Director for Central Bank Digital Currencies, FMIs and Blockchains at Fireblocks. Prior to joining Fireblocks two years ago, I spent most of my career at the Bank of England. Uh, and so um, bringing the Fireblocks te technology to central banks and FMIs all around the world. And Fireblocks, for those of you who don't know, is a digital asset technology provider that supports the secure issuance and management of tokenized assets and tokenized money, including stablecoins all around the world. Great to be here. Thank you all. And I'm going to kick off with a question for Johnny. Um, you have, you know, in addition to your role looking at digital asset strategy at ClearBank, you've long been a commentator and active observer in this space and have been, you know, observing and commenting on the development of the market and digital assets and digital money for quite some time. Um, in your work at ClearBank, obviously, you are looking at uh, you know, you're a B2B bank as opposed to a B2C bank. So you're looking at the solutions that your clients actually want to offer their clients. And what are you seeing as the, the potential um, emerging across the market for those sorts of innovative business to client solutions um, for which you can provide support? Okay, so I think um, one of the things worth bearing in mind is, is the relatively small size of the crypto market. Um, it's it's today about 2.4 um, trillion. It's just turned over. If you look at the Amazon coin gecko, about 100 billion. 70% of that turnover is stable coins. So this is clearly in a very small market, something which is which is a, a lot of interest to people involved in that space. And we bank a number of um, crypto companies that are regulated. And that, that's what we do. So if you're a crypto company, you're regulated, you're in the UK, then please come and talk to us. But it's actually the bigger part of the pie that we're interested in, in the sense that if crypto is, say, two and a half trillion, if you look at the um, equity bond funds, real estate um, and derivatives market, that's 2.2 quadrillion. And nearly all those assets have three payments. One, you, you put money in. Second, you take money out. But whilst it's in, there are these things called um, distributions, dividends, coupons, bond, um, uh, in, in, in interest, which is payable. And as we start to see... Um, and Daniela was talking about this in terms of mentioned um, Franklin Templeton, but Franklin Templeton isn't alone. We're seeing a number of very, very large asset management companies, um, BlackRock, Aberdeen Standard, Amande, and we, there's a number coming out in the next three or four months, and they're digitizing, tokenizing their money market funds. Their money market funds in this country are relatively small, 50 billion. In Europe, they're about 1.7 trillion. In the States, they're about 6 trillion. So as, as an asset class, about $9 trillion, that's four times the size of the crypto market. And as they start to digitize, they're going to be making these payments on a much, much more frequent basis. So instead of making distributions on a, um, on a say, six-monthly basis, they're going to go to monthly, as indeed BlackRock have just recently announced on their institutional money market fund, and then potentially going to go weekly. And it's, it's at that time that you're going to start seeing a requirement for um, programmability, and that's probably the key word I'd use at the moment with our clients. They're looking to be able to take out, um, if you like, the human interaction involvement, and they want pre-programmed payments to be made, which is just very, very difficult to do with traditional um, sort of banking rails. But but we're not saying the wholesale switch out of, um, if you like, um, the fiat banking rails, but it's very much seeing um, a digital twin being created alongside traditional banking, which is what we are, a traditional UK clearing bank, but to give the tools and services that our, our clients who, as you correctly said, businesses, they're looking to build in and build in new products and new ways to have a stronger, more control, better compliance regime by having that programmability. Thanks, Johnny. I'm going to go to Andy next um, as a representative of um, the, the only active stablecoin issuer on this panel at the moment, and indeed one of the largest stablecoin issuers in the world. Um, 
Stable coins such as USDC and USDT have traditionally primarily been used and active on uh, cryptocurrency exchanges where users will use them for settlement purposes or to hold funds in fiat currency um, on the exchange um, without having to, to off ramp. So, but that obviously that's, you know, that is not the biggest target market. We wouldn't be having all these discussions um, with regulators and policymakers about the future of stable coins if that was the only use for stable coins. And where do you see things going at Circle? What are some of the interesting discussions and use cases and applications that you've seen for USDC and other Circle coins going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to pick up on on uh, several themes that, that Danelle raised in her excellent um, discussion. Um, but, you know, I think fundamentally the way we see and, and what actually excites me most about seeing stable coins um, and their various use cases is that fundamentally it's a microfinance tool. Um, and it allows the, the, the same benefits that have traditionally accrued to institutional players in the financial space, the speed, the thing, you know, real time growth settlement, all these things, it brings them down to the micro level. And so we've seen a number of interesting applications that allow for, um, you know, for some of those same benefits at the, you know, at the, at the person at the, you know, the remittance level at the, you know, the individual at the high risk jurisdiction levels um, that, that, uh, that Danelle mentioned. And, you know, just yesterday I was, I was having a conversation with, with a developer, for example, um, who was, who's working on um, microfinance insurance payments for crop farmers in, in Kenya. And interestingly, he was using uh, Johnny to pick up on some of the examples you're saying about this programmable smart contract um, uh, 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 technology. He was using smart contracts to essentially automate the process for um, ensuring seed and fertilizer payments to local farmers. So that in the event that there was too much rain in a season or too little rain, that they would essentially automatically get payment or uh, uh, receive a, a new batch of seeds and fertilizer, all processed on the blockchain automatically using weather data and USDC for payments. Um, and these are the, some of the types of the things that, you know, I think as you think on the, the kind of the macro scale, it breaks away the need to have that backend infrastructure that goes into the, um, you know, on the macro level, the correspondent banking system, but, you know, all the way down to, to you know, the, the more complex banking relationships, uh, establishment of, um, you know, credit, all these other things, and it kind of automates that, that microfinance process. So I think that's what really gets us excited. And there's just, you know, developers coming out of the, you know, the woodworks who have very innovative ways of bringing this technology to bear. Thanks, Andy. And I think one thing I'm hearing from you and, you know, I think picking up on, on Tina's introduction as well is the key thing, of, you know, about stablecoins. They represent a digital native form of money um, and an on-ledger native form of money, which means that for um, to realize some of the true benefits of blockchain and DLT use cases, such as in digital trade or supply chains or agriculture, or, you know, many of these other types of things, you have to have that kind of on-ledger settlement mechanism and stable coins therefore play you know a crucial role in that ecosystem um but sean i know that you have also been thinking about some of the more innovative kind of commercial use cases around stable coins and how they could um you know how the economics of stable coins um raise interesting applications as well and i think Johnny mentioned tokenized money market funds. Um, we often think of stable coins as just being, you know, tokenized fiat money, but obviously they can have many different types of backing assets and that can lead to many different potential uses of those stable coins as well. So tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, obviously I think it's a great example um, for, for remittances or cross-border transfers. We're coming at it from more of a business perspective and uh, I might give two real life examples of how stable coins are being used by our clients in a, in a business transfer world. And I'll also kind of uh, nod my hat to the, the direction of travel that I think you're mentioning, Jana, in terms of the, the yield bearing stable coins or what we think are the next innovation um, coming. Um, uh, if I may just give two, two client cases, and these were kind of um, uh, more opportunistic just to give a feel for how stables are being used by businesses. Um, one of our clients uh, is a drop shipping group, which means uh, there's no warehousing, but it's typically importing goods from uh, uh, emerging markets or foreign markets into the West. They're using stables to transfer money real time um, and then settling back into, say, euro or GBP uh, to pay that final leg 
of, of purchase or, or sale um, with the view that if you can cut out the, the days of settlement it takes on, say, SWIFT or with counterparty clearing, you can ex make a more expedited transfer of funds uh, with, with real businesses that enable to deliver uh, soon products without having that, that counterparty risk or, or, or credit risk for settlement delays. One other case, which I think is, is probably more of the stellar street, um, is uh, what we're seeing in uh, transfers of goods or services across uh, emerging markets to, to the West or vice versa. Dropshipping is at the coalface of one particular industry, but uh, we, we have a client called uh, Digital RFQ. And what they do is, for example, in, in an African context, transfer local currency to, say, USTC or to Tether, transfer that Tether real time uh, to the, the West, say, Europe, and then from that last leg, transfer Tether back into Euro. And you're able to settle then, say, Naira from Nigeria to Euro. Um, two fiat currencies using stable as a bridge um, in, in near real time. Whereas if you had done that on the traditional rails, that would probably take five days. And given the, the, the local context of a business, particularly in a country like Nigeria, where inflation is, is quite um, uh, rampant and the, and the FX risk, uh, given the movement of the local currency is material, five days can actually impact uh, the, the capacity to, to do trade. Uh, and we see this as a significant de-risking exercise, which is, for me, why I think stablecoins are the, the killer app, if you will, um, for real businesses to come in to the digital space at those, at those points of friction. And those points of friction are typically delays or, or issues where you're not getting the liquidity that you would expect from the traditional payment uh, ecosystem. Um, moving forward, and the yield-bearing point that I think um, uh, is something that we're following very closely, We've heard of the money market funds being tokenized. I think our, our chats recently did this in the UK with uh, Tomorrow Next and Onera. Um, and we're seeing also the likes of uh, gilts or treasuries being tokenized. And the banks are also talking about tokenized deposits. So there, there are various options now um, when you talk about the, the, the DPF uh, and the diversity of payments. Um, there is now a choice emerging for consumers as to which types of rails they might use. And not to say that the non-yield bearing stablecoins are in the future, obviously, they're, they're being used. Um, and, and Johnny gave some excellent figures as to the, 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 the velocity of money that stables are having versus other cryptos. Um, but I think when consumers have a choice to use money that has some benefit for them, even if it's on a short-term capacity, a little bit of a crystal ball is I think consumers would vote with their feet um, for certain types of flows. I'm going to ignore the regulatory and policy discussions. I think we're parking that. Um, but we, we are seeing a lot of innovation in that space. And it seems to be where a lot of the excitement is happening in, in our client base and in our counterparties. Thanks, Sean. And Varun, you have, um, you know, a Firebox um, has a lot of engagement with a hugely diverse set of market participants, um, particularly on the wholesale side, um, I think, and, and in, in the you know financial institution sector um but also more widely as well um so what sorts of use cases are you seeing um emerge um when it comes to stable coins yeah absolutely i mean the first thing to say is that we've seen a massive rise in the use of stable coins and it really has dominated in the past two years in particular we've seen across the five blocks platform the use uh the share of stable coins in transactions across five blocks rise from around 30 percent up to 60% in just two years. And it just shows, uh, to Johnny's point earlier, uh, how um, important stable coins are. And obviously that's very relevant in the crypto market as a kind of uh, store of value between trades. But we're seeing increasing demand from banks and financial institutions who also want to, to be able to create and issue their own stable coins of, sort of, of a variety of different types uh, around the world. Um, but there are a number of different use cases we're seeing. So... Uh, when you think about the cross-border use case, um, as Sean described, if you can move value across borders in a matter of minutes rather than days, it has real value to corporate treasurers at large global companies. Uh, and we're seeing increased appetite from, from these big companies to, to, to leverage a stablecoin as a rail to move value across borders. 
Um, and then when you think about uh, some of the, the large payments companies we're working with, think of the likes of WorldPay and Checkout.com. They're able to facilitate those, those payments across borders and actually um, deliver value to, uh, to, to creators uh, in, in, in a much shorter time frame. So think of the Web3 creators out there who are able to uh, receive money in a stable coin uh, and, and then able to use those funds at a much shorter time frame than they would in the traditional rails. Um, but also think about the um, kind of gig economy use case where uh, the person who is renting out their property over a weekend is able to receive value in a stable coin much faster uh, and then and continue their business uh, around that. And so what we're seeing is both across the, the, the corporate scale, but also the, the, the gig economy and the, the creator side, the, the simple fact that you can move value on chain much more quickly, uh, whether it's domestically or cross borders, is showing to have real, real value. Uh, and so we're seeing um, uh, real, real appetite there. And, and to get onto a broader point, as we've said, having money on chain is really important for the future of the financial system. There's huge demand in the in the wholesale side to create more and more tokenized assets, uh, and all the benefits for tokenized assets can really only be realized when you have tokenized money on chain, and so stable coins will be a real part of that solution. Thanks, Warren. And for the benefit of the audience, I just wanted to to, to dive a little more deeply into why stable coins are more efficient when it comes to cross-border payments. Um, and, and this is largely due to the correspondent banking system that we have today and the ways that kind of banks access um, each other across border. There's it's not just a matter of, you know, bank A in the UK and bank B in um, India or South Africa um, communicating with each other for various reasons. There are layers of intermediaries. Sometimes the reasons are regulatory. Sometimes there are commercial barriers, connectivity barriers and things like that. And each of those intermediaries requires um, takes takes basically a little bit off each transaction. And that's why cross-border transactions cost so much. Whereas with stable coins, we have the opportunity to bypass those infrastructures completely and create means of transferring value um, across borders that's you know as simple as just transferring message across the network, basically. Um, if that's not too simplistic, Andy, I can see you'd like to jump in there. Yeah, I think this is a, an incredibly important point, and Brun and Sean hit on it, uh, you know, so well. But you know, I think zooming, zooming out to kind of the highest level, you know, what we're talking about here is settlement risk, and there, and there's more than two point two trillion dollars per day in foreign exchange currency transactions that are exposed to some form of, of settlement risk that we discussed. Um, and so, you know, we've looked in, you know, we looked into this in in, in particular between uh, our two stable coins. Of, you know, how do you actually look at you know, FX transactions between, you know, USDC and EURC, and how do you assess the costs and benefits? Um, and, you know, what we did is, you know, using the, the Uniswap protocol, which is, uh, which is an automated market maker, which essentially creates an instant um, swap market for, you know, for currencies. In this case, we looked at what it would cost for a $500, let's say, payment. You know, we've all been tourists stuck in, a, in another country um, and needing to get cash out and having to go pay exorbitant rates for, you know, just on the personal level to, to convert that currency. Um, but on a $500 transaction, you know, we came up with, with essentially one to five basis points. So, you know, we're talking about 10 cents to uh, you know, fifteen dollars, which the fifteen dollars would be at the upper upper bound, um, you know, is the same as a credit card uh, fee for for transacting across borders into new currencies. And the really interesting thing, I think, when you look at this, is that not only can you do that, um, you know, on an, on an instant basis, um, but it's also available on weekends. And when you look at the data, and we, we went back and looked at all of the history of, of swaps between these two currencies, it trades incredibly well with the start of price, uh, the, the opening um, FX, official FX rate on Monday morning on Saturday afternoon. And there's a very tight correlation between the official rates at times when most traditional markets are closed. So that presents benefits at both the institutional and the, the individual level. And the last thing I'll note is that from a user perspective, as well as from an institutional perspective, it, it creates real-time price discovery. Um, and so one of the hardest things that you as an individual might be as a tourist in some you know, juris, you know, country that you're trying to exchange your money for is, is this a fair price that I'm getting? 
Um, and, and the fact that you can look at uh, on-chain data and, and get that real-time price discovery for the entire market um, that, again, tracks with the global kind of FX, uh, you know, official rates um, is, is, is incredibly powerful. And it's, and it's a good market deterrent um, and, and ultimately, you know, prevents market manipulation in, in many ways. And obviously, uh, you know, as it scales, it would, would further do so. Johnny, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, there's a couple of points I wanted to make. First of all, if you look at the, the data from the consulting firm McKinsey, um, at the moment, the, the amount of income revenue that's generated on payments globally is, is somewhere around about $2 trillion a year. And that's estimated to be increasing to $3 trillion um, by uh, 2027. So it's no surprise that we're seeing Mr. Musk with his sort of, you know, uh, his app of everything, X, and we've seen people like uh, well, all the huge number of fintech businesses and new banks trying to get into this space because they realize that, that there's, there's, there's a lot of fat in the system. You know, the, the World Bank reckoning costs four or five percent, as you say, to international remittances. But bearing in mind the, the typical audience that we've got listeners today, I think it's very relevant to bring it back to the UK. Um, we're about to have an election in this country, um, as indeed they're going to have in, in the States. And one of the key um, challenges that UK businesses face is a lack of productivity. Now, having been involved and run a number of small companies myself over the years, many, many small companies do not go bust because they're not profitable. The reason they go bust is because they have liquidity issues, either owed money by suppliers and by, by customers, I mean, and they just don't get paid. And you, know, you have this crazy situation where the financial markets are, are rapidly moving um, to T0, we have the situation whereby you've got delivery versus payment. And it kind of seems crazy. If it's good enough for the goose, either the city, why isn't it good enough for the gander? Why can't 95% of companies globally who are SMEs that employ 60 to 70% of all employees in the world, why can't they get paid faster? If they get paid faster, the velocity of money increases, productivity increases, taxation receipts increase. And the current banking system um, I think there's there's room for improvement. And I'm not saying you throw it out, but certainly give people the choice to say, I have delivered a product or good and a service, but I'm only going to do it provided I know you're going to pay me. And once I've, once I've fulfilled my part of the bargain, I'd like to be paid for it. So I think actually the digital payments opens up a huge number of opportunities for SMEs, which I suggest many of the couple of hundred people listening to this call are currently working for. Thanks, Johnny. I have another couple of questions for the panel generally, and then we'll go to some of the Q and A. Um, but the first question is: I think you discussed a, a, you know, potentially a variety of different types of stable coins and stable coins existing in different niches of um, the the economic ecosystem. And as we move forward into the future. How do we think these different types of stable coins will coexist? Um, what will that kind of landscape of digital money look like in the future? And what roles will different types of stable coins play, especially sitting alongside some of the other new forms of digital money that have been touched upon, such as tokenized deposits um, issued by commercial banks, um, or even CBDCs, central bank digital currencies as well. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Vern, on that. Yeah, thanks. It's a really good point. So obviously we've talked about the, the value that stablecoins bring and, they, and they're really forging the way and showing um, that they can transform the financial system, but they won't be able to do everything in the future. And I talked about tokenized assets and some regulations require that tokenized assets are settled in central bank money, for example. So there's a role for other types of money, whether that is a central bank digital currency. And, and certainly I mentioned banks wanting to issue money and some of them will do so as tokenized deposits. But this is about stable coins. And I, and I want to emphasize that while those two forms of money will exist and they will have a key role for some transactions, whether they're wholesale or retail, there will always be a role for stable coins in my view. And, and there's a real fundamental reason for that. And that's that I think stable coins can reach further. And I say that because they can go across borders, uh, across jurisdictions, as we've seen already to date, in a way that uh, the more uh, traditional uh, central bank issued or commercial bank issued money will be able to. Um, and either way, I think there will be a future where we'll have a variety, a real diversity of tokenized money on chain. And so I really do see a future for stable coins existing alongside tokenized deposits and, and CBDCs. Um, and as I say, I think we'll see um, 
much more immediate use of the stable coins and we'll see how they'll show their show their worth whether they're issued by the likes of circle or by others um and in many different currencies over the next couple of years i think we're on the cusp of seeing many many more stable coins issued uh, and we'll see how this uh, proliferation of stable coins plays out and that proliferation of stable coins is it just the normal course of um, an emerging market um, is it a good thing or a bad thing from a consumer perspective thoughts from the rest of the panel well Jana it's, it's Johnny here again I, I I hope we don't go back to what we had in America in the 1860s when we had 5,000 different issues of US dollars because that would be frightfully confusing um, uh, maybe Andrew, you, you would love it, you know, and sort of because Circle would shine out to be the number one. But um, I, I think we, we, we need to be very mindful that at the moment, um, and with respect to Circle, um, most of the stable coins are a payment mechanism. And I think what we need, and Sean touched on this, we need a way that people can actually hold their money in a digital format and they can be paid the interest that they deservedly should be receiving. Um, and, and we have a situation like, like um, a number of stable coins, and I, I will mention one of them, and that's USDE. It calls itself a stable coin. Its investment objective is very much a stable coin. But if you look at its investment strategy, it, it, it's, it's selling volatility um, in the crypto market. Well, fantastic, because selling volatility or buying volatility sometimes can be a hugely profitable thing. But for me, being very simplistic and having been in the asset management industry for nearly 40 years, that sounds to me more like a hedge fund than something... Not really what more... you want your money to be doing. Well, yeah, but it, but that's the trouble with stable coins. Stable coins, they're, they, they're labelled stable coins. They're, they're given this dreadful label. They should be pegged. And I know you and I have had this debate a number of times, Jana, uh, and that is... It, but the semantics are really, really important because you could argue the HSBC gold... Um, token they've recently. If, if you're a gold miner and you spend and earn money in gold, then that would be your stable coin of choice. And that's from HSBC, one of the biggest banks in the world. So this, th these things are happening. But to say to lump it all into stable coin, I think that's going to be frightfully, frightfully confusing. But the, the other point I just wanted to make is that the the stable coins are changing the nature of money. And what I mean by that is, if you put a pound into Lloyd's Bank. It becomes Lloyd's Bank money, and I, I'm a creditor if it was my if it was my hundred pounds. If Lloyd's Bank give me a stable coin, then it, it's it remains my money, and they become custodians potentially as opposed to trustees. And it means I can then take my ten pounds, hundred pounds, and give it to Varum or give it to you, and he can give it to um, Andrew, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it changes the nature of the way that the money is flowing around the system, and I think that has a number of consequences and a number of intrinsic advantages because we're going back in time to creating a bearer security. And the regulators have spent the last 50 years trying to get rid of a bearer security, but this time it's different. It has one of those. Well, it's not a grubby finger, it's a fingerprint. <laughs> so we should be able to track and trace where this bearer instrument is being placed. And I think that's what we're all trying to get our heads around because there's pros and cons of that, without a doubt. Mm. Thanks, Danny. Sean, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I was thinking um, uh, uh, to, to your question in terms of the diversity, again, of, of different op options of money. I, I think it's very healthy to have choice, um, yeah, even cash. I think it's, it's important to retain um, uh, competition within uh, the, con the consumer availability of options. There's a whole host of factors that I think people will choose one or other option. Wholesale and retail payments are very different. Uh, confidentiality of where money is going, where it's coming from, is also something that people really value. Uh, which is one of the questions around CBDCs and kind of how that plays out, um, which is uh, uh, kind of working through differently in the West, perhaps, than in some countries. Um, and that's, that's a healthy byproduct of democracy. Uh, I, I think there's also a question around um, uh, uh, how these competitions of different payment realms might address what, what Johnny very, very rightfully outlined in terms of the total fees taken across the payments ecosystem, going from two, two trillion to three trillion is, is huge. Um, and if we look at digitization as a trend to reduce cost, I think it's not just the velocity in terms of payments that could increase productivity, but that there's also uh, fat in the system that if, if you can think about, instead of needing, say, these expensive cross-border transfers to, to, to require multiple correspondent banks taking fees, if you make this digitized and make that much cleaner and simpler and reduce the frictional costs, maybe that's not going to be McKinsey being correct. Maybe it'll be staying at two trillion or dropping a little bit. And that money can go back into the productive economy 
um, and, and hopefully address some of the productivity issues by allowing people to invest more in, in real goods and services and businesses. Um, and, and I think you're not going to see that necessarily unless there is competition. If, if there's a, a, a subset of just say a, a couple of banks running running the show, um, you, you end up back in oligopolistic kind of pricing architectures. You, you need competition to to achieve innovation. Thanks, Sean. And going through some of the questions quickly, we've had a couple of mentions of the risk associated with stable coins. I mean, our intention with this webinar is to like focus on some of the positives around innovation, but um, what are some of the potential risks and downsides to stable coins? I mean, we've had a few mentions in the chat of things like privacy. Obviously, the stability of stable coins is, is a huge risk, but maybe we could talk about some of the other potentially darker sides of stable coins um, and, you know, where um, should they not be, um, you know, be, be used or implemented or issued with, you know, good intentions behind them. Um, there, there could be downsides socially and econ economically. Jan, I don't mind I kicking off on that. I think there's two, two issues there. One is the risk of the coin itself, um, depegging. Um, and we've seen examples of that in, 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 in some cases, so-called stable coins becoming very, very unstable because the, the collateral that they're exposed to. Um, and, and I think this is a problem potentially with um, the current proposals. I know we're not going to get into regulation, but some of the current proposals that whereby potentially um, you, you're talking about some of the central banks saying that they're, they're not going to allow central bank deposits to be used as backing for a stable coin and paying interest. Um, and I think that's, um, I, I, this is a personal opinion. I think that personally is a huge mistake um, because it, all it's going to do, you're going to have to back those coins by non-central bank deposits and therefore they are liable to uh, the underlying assets. Your, your point about stable coins being used, let, let's just use it in a decentralized manner. And I think this is something we're going to have to just get used to. Um, and that is dealing um, in, in, in a global market is, is kind of going to be here to stay. Um, and I think that's something which we've just got to find a way to get comfortable with. You know, we're spending 200 billion a year on money laundering. 99.99% um, .99 of transactions that happen are not nefarious. Um, it's people having a cup of tea or buying a sticky bun or buying a car or something like that. It's, it, yet we've got this huge infrastructure and cost center on, on trying to stop these transactions. But if you can move money you know, digitally anywhere like that, then there will be nefarious actors that will actually be using it to ship all sorts of horrible goods and services. Um, and that's going to be a challenge. But at least if it's digital and you've got a fingerprint of where it's going, you stand a chance of being able to lock down some of those wallets, accounts, um, use cases, hopefully. Thanks. If I can jump in, Jenna, I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And Johnny, that was very well said. You know, um, I think Danelle said in the beginning that stable coins have to be stable. And I think you're seeing a, a consensus across a lot of the emerging regulatory regimes, you know, in what that exactly looks like in terms of reserve act, uh, reserve access and, um, and other uh, backing assets. And I think that when you look at, um, you know, the, the other elements, of, of you know what makes uh, you know sound redemption policies and other things like those are the factors that um, you know are coming into place that really do uh, you know in, in kind of enshrine that that fundamental use as a payment tool because I think that's a differentiator between some of the other innovations out there the tokenized money market funds the the CBDCs um, you know which which differentiates itself from you know, the fact that tokenized uh, stable coins are essentially tokenized cash and they are meant to be the simple bearer instrument that in many ways is the sinew between, uh, you know, all of these other tokenized, uh, uh, you know, funds and assets. And I think that that is, is kind of where things are shifting. But I would differentiate there that when you look at a stable coin, it is a prudential, it should be a prudentially managed, uh, you know, essentially bearer asset, you know, that is different from some of the other um, hedge fund backed assets or algorithmic um you know, or other, uh, 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 you know, self, self-purported stable coins. Thanks. And I think I found a great question from the audience to end on. Um, 30 seconds each on this one. In a future where we have various stable coins, will consumers need to understand the difference between them? I think this is actually a really important question. Or will stable coins become more like commercial bank money today? Just as the difference between Barclays pounds and NatWest pounds don't matter to the consumer. Uh, so particularly in the instance where we have a proliferation of stable coins coming up, 30 seconds each, Varun, let's go with you. 
I think in the immediate term, because it won't be fully regulated, I think there will be a reality where people have to be careful about which one they use and they'll go by trust and they'll pick their favorite or whatever, the right use case. But I think the ultimate outcome has to be that they shouldn't have to worry. Uh, if they're a regulated stable coin ecosystem, they should be equivalent and that's the job of regulation. Thanks. Andy. Um, Varun said it perfectly. I think absolutely not. Um, you know, it's great to see more entrance into the stablecoin, uh, you know, discussion and market, um, you know, across the world. And I think that we will see over time the the technology fade to the background. And I think that's as well as the the kind of the, the corporate element of it fade to the background. Ultimately, um, I think it'll be more important to see stablecoins denominated in different currencies and to see, um, you know, the whole range where you're talking about your USD stablecoin interacting with your um, you know, pound or, or you know, lira stable coin. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in the long run, absolutely not. But do do agree with Varun that in the short term, it, it, there is significant variance, in, you know, in the market between various stable coins. Sure. I, I think financial education is very important, particularly for retail consumers. And I think if there is a yield bearing option, um, it would be important for them to realize that they have choice. I, I think um, I, I agree, though, it, it, it should be kind of a a very simple user interface and they should have a lot of trust um, thanks thanks to market participants and regulation. I think at a wholesale level, I think treasurers and commercial commercial and um, banks will have to be very au fait with the changes because they'll be the ones at the call face delivering the change um, and they'll have to know what's what's, uh, what's available for them to achieve their best objectives. Thank you. And Johnny, 30 seconds, mind. Um... Uh, it, it, it's interesting that you've you've posed this question. You've probably thought of this question last night, and then that's why you're asking. I did it. not. It's, it's, <laughs> no, it, it's such a good question, and the reason the reason it's such a good question is, is just one word: Meta, Libra. It all started arguably with Facebook coming out. With, they have a global brand with two billion odd people interacting with them. Many people probably trust um, companies, you know, some of the fangs more more than the banks, and therefore, if they came out with a coin that actually did it. Um, I'm not sure that's what the regular wants, regulator wants, but um, I think ultimately, um, you know, they've got huge distribution. And I think that's going to be a real challenge for the regulator and, and the incumbent banking banks. But I think the way it'll go is it'll be the banks that will end up um, dominating this space because they do have distribution and people to some extent do, do still trust them. Thank you. Well, thank you. To, it's 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 four oh one right now. So thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to Danel for a fantastic keynote. Thank you to Tina for the introduction. Um, thank you to Crypto UK for partnering with us on this event, um, which will be um, will be making publicly available. Um, so you can share it with you know others if you'd like. Um, sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but thank you to the audience as well for joining in.